Uh, my name's Kirby Eichen. I'm the President and Chairman of the Board of the National Space Society. Hasn't this been an absolutely fabulous conference so far? It's just... <laughs> it's a great testament to the teams, the people, the organisations that are behind this. I'm not going to begin to name them all because you've heard about them before. But it is the beginning of the culmination of the conference. We still have one more day to go, but uh, tonight is a very important evening with our awards banquet. It's our night for celebrating the contributions of individuals and organisations towards furthering the goals of a spacefaring nation and to promoting space development itself. And that concept of space development and space settlements is a very important thing at the heart of the interests of those of us gathered here today. In terms of our awards, we'll be presenting the Robert A. Heinlein Memorial Award, which is voted on by the members of NSS. As well, we'll have the Space Pioneer Award for Science and Engineering, the 2006 NSS Awards, National Awards for Excellence, and the Chris Pankratz Space Activist of the Year Award. We're also honoured to have with us tonight Dr. Jim Rice from Arizona State University, and of course our featured guest speaker, Peter Diamandis. Uh, I'm sure he needs little introduction, but he is internationally recognised as a high technology entrepreneur and one of the pioneers in developing and promoting commercial space. This is only a pre-dinner welcome. Um, please enjoy your uh, dinner and dessert. We will be coming back probably at about 7.45 or thereabouts to start our speeches and our presentations. Please enjoy your meal and I'll be back again in a little while. Thank you very much and welcome. Now, the celebratory part of the evening, our first presentation uh, will be by Dr. Jim Rice. Uh, he's a member of the science team with the Mars Rovers, and he's from Arizona, Arizona State University, as I mentioned at the outset. And uh, a term that we heard mentioned last night, um, he is an astrogeologist. So on that note, may I invite Dr. Jim Rice to give us a brief presentation. Send it all backwards real quick, so don't look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, before I get started, I just want to say it's a pleasure being here tonight. I want to thank George for inviting me to come give you a little briefing about our little rovers. They're still strong and going on Mars. Um, even my mother wonders what we're still doing with these rovers, so hopefully I can enlighten you in case you don't know. Well, um, here's a picture, a self-portrait of spirit and opportunity from our pan cam camera, rather than a mask looking down. You can see uh, they're fairly clean looking after spending over two years on Mars. But uh, here's a little update. We were told uh, at NASA headquarters that if we lasted 90 days, or 90 stalls, which is a Mars day, and drove each rover 600 meters, that was considered mission success. And as of today, on Spirit is Sol 831. We are 741 days past our warranty. Uh, the engineers gave us, and uh, you can see we've driven well over 600 meters. We've got uh, over s close to 7,000 meters with uh, Spirit and over 7,000 meters with Opportunity, and uh, we're still going. So. <laughs> Most of you probably have heard more about Opportunity. That's kind of been the star of the rovers. Uh, I found evidence that we have lake beds on Mars, something that us scientists speculated on for decades, and we finally found hard geologic proof of this in the rocks. And I could spend hours talking to you tonight about all the scientific details, but I'd probably get yanked off the stage by a couple people, so I've got to be brief. But uh, when we landed with Spirit on January 3rd, 2004, we saw these hills off in the distance, about three kilometers away. And uh, they were named by NASA headquarters the Columbia Hills in honor of the Columbia astronauts. And uh, we all as geologists dreamed of going there, but none of us in our right mind thought we'd ever get there. And you, you can see by for scale, this height of the Statue of Liberty, roughly. And we have uh, climbed Husband Hill, the highest hill. We've climbed Husband Hill now. We've gone down the south flanks and in this inner valley. So we made it to the hill and found a lot of interesting things. And I'll try to give you a briefing on some of that quickly here. Um, we found a lot of salt in the soil. These are iron sulfate salts. 
This is indicative of some water activity in the past. Uh, this is mostly probably groundwater, not like the water the opportunity found with the lake beds there. But it is evidence of water on Mars, and if there's water on liquid water on Mars, you automatically start thinking about the question of habitability and life forms. And that's what we were sent there to find, and I think we've done the job with both rovers. We've been lucky, Mars has been cooperative. Um, this is a picture of some dust devils we caught with uh, Spirit in the Columbia Hills uh, about a year ago. Um, as you know, these vehicles are solar powered, and dust continually rains out of the Martian atmosphere. The dust on Mars is the size of, is the size of cigarette smoke, microns. It's raining out in our solar panels, uh, decreases our power. But we got lucky. These gusts of winds came, came through there, cleaned this, clean this dust off. We got power up almost as like we had the night we landed. So uh, we've been, these things just don't want to die. Um, I'm a geologist, and uh, we love rocks. To a geologist, a rock is a history book. It's got a lot written in there if you know what you're looking for. And we got some pretty smart people on the team and some great instruments and these rovers. And we drive up these rocks. These are layered rocks. This is a place called Home Plate we came to on Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, it was named in honor of, uh, uh, it looked like a baseball diamond from orbit. And uh, we finally got there and uh, we saw these rocks. And this is the first layered rocks we saw with Spirit. You know, like I said, we've seen these as opportunity before the night we landed, as a matter of fact. And uh, we got there and we found the lower part of these rocks, the lower member, just to give you a little geology, fairly, fairly coarse grain rocks. And the upper members were finely layered, uh, fine grain laminated rocks, which, and this tells us what we think home plate feature is. I don't want to bore you with too many details, but it was a uh, possibility it was a volcanic eruption into some shallow groundwater or ice table. It's one of our leading hypotheses now. And uh, that coarse unit you see there at the bottom is something we call a base surge deposit. And the upper one is the finer units we see in volcanic eruptions on Earth. Uh, this slide shows you more pictures of the rocks. And like I said, these uh, to geologists, this is like what you want, rocks in place called outcrop. And uh, we see this layer in here. It's still a debate among the team exactly how this formed, but the leading hypothesis, it looks like it would be volcanic, but the other one could be an impact uh, crater deposits. But uh, we're about to learn more when the spring comes around. Uh, on Sol 779, back in March, um, our right front wheel on Spirit quit working. The actuator motor no longer, drive motor no longer works. So this means we're dragging this wheel everywhere we're going. You can see the drag we're doing there. <laughs> and uh, it's going to slow us down, but uh, we're, you know, these things have six wheels and we can operate on five, so we're still doing fine. Um, right now, uh, it's fall on Mars. Seasons are twice as long on Mars as they are on Earth. Uh, these are solar powered vehicles, so we've got to get to a north facing slope of the Spirit since we're 15 degrees south of the equator, and that's where we're heading when this picture was taken. We've uh, down to about driving only one hour a day, and our best of times. In the summertime, we can operate uh, from 10 a.m. to around 2 or 3 p.m. science operations. Now it's really cut down. The sun is sinking low in the northern sky. And uh, that bright stuff there is that salt I showed you earlier. It's kind of ubiquitous in this region. This is just a quick picture to show you. Uh, home plate is what Spirit found. Uh, Pace and outcrop is what Opportunity has been looking at. At first blush, these rocks look very look similar. They are layered rock, but there's a different story there. Uh, the Pace and rock were deposited underwater as lake, lake beds. And the home plate deposit, we think, were a volcanic eruption. It involves some groundwater, possible ground ice. Um, this is a pretty cool picture. This is our heat shield. Opportunity's heat shield that slammed in on January 24th, 2004. We drove to it, and you can see what the remain, we're an impact crater there, and uh, what's left of the heat shield, it flipped inside out. We also found something very unusual here. It's not this picture, but there's a, a meteorite we called, found sitting out there. So this is not a good place, it's an iron nickel meteorite, it's not a good place to hang out because metal falls from the sky a lot here. <laughs> That's Steve Squire's line, so I gotta give credit for it. Um, uh, this is a close up of the rocks that uh, Opportunity's been looking at, the layered rocks. These are the, we think, the lake, the lake beds, basically. Um, That's a three foot exposure. This is just showing the terrain the Opportunity's driving across near the equator. It's pretty benign, easy to drive across, some sand, some ripples of basaltic sand, and some outcrop. Um, but pretty easy compared to what uh, Spirit goes through. This just shows you where the landing sites are. Meridiani near the equator is where Opportunity is driving around as we speak. And Gusev Crater is where Spirit is, a little, like I said, about 15 degrees south of the equator. So Opportunity can still work through the upcoming winter. Spirit needs to park and basically charge up its batteries every day. So we're not driving anywhere with Spirit right now. We'll be at this place called Low Ridge. We'll be there probably until December. And, um, there's a lot of science we're doing along the way, though, as we're sit sitting there doing some detailed panoramas and some surface uh, measurements, mechanics. 
soils. But uh, this is a picture from uh, Spirit. And I think this is the bottom line on this one. It's both rovers have had, had to endure some tough terrain, harsh weather. Uh, we've had some headaches back on the ground. We had to deal with it every now and then. But both rovers did find signs of water on Mars, which is a big deal. And now, after two years, it seems to be routine. But we often sit back and think about what we have found with these rovers, these historic pr proportions, and it kind of blows us away. This is just a cool kind of picture of uh, the sun setting for opportunity. That bowl out there is an uh, endurance crater. We spent six months studying that uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, this is something uh, for names. Uh, I bug Steve Squires. I said we need, need to name these features here around this home plate. You can see there the round white feature. And I had the idea to name them after uh, pioneers of the space program, space age, shall I say. And uh, you can see the one name in there. Um, well, you can see, uh, these names probably mean a lot to everybody in this room. Uh, Here's a close-up of Von Braun Hill, which to me, I came from, Alabama, I'm from Alabama originally, and Von Braun lived at the street from me, the Marshall Space Flight Center, and it was an honor to name something on Mars after him. Uh, his dream was to get astronauts to Mars, still haven't done it, hopefully it will happen in my lifetime, but uh, we don't know right now, but that's a picture of Von Braun Hill, and uh, yeah, I think uh, the last picture I have here is uh, these two gentlemen, I think, would be pretty proud of these hunks of metal driving around on Mars. But they'd be wondering when we send the people, and uh, hopefully, like I said, we're going to get our act together and uh, go back to the moon and get on up, get on to it. But uh, I'll stop there because I'm probably going to get yanked off. But uh, I'll be around. If you have questions, you can come bug me later afterwards. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
And at that, that decade ago, I was speaking about this crazy idea of suborbital flight. So uh, tonight, in the context, I'm going to speak about some other crazy ideas from the next decade. Um, so let's have a little, little fun here. Um, first, uh, uh, I want to let you know that I, today's been a, a really fun day. I had uh, two zero-G flights up in San Jose for Google. Flew up here to do this, and I'm flying back at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning to fly the, uh, the fourth one. So uh, we just did um, three zero-G flights in a day, which is a record for us, so we're really excited about that. Um, Don't worry, Peter, it'll be worse the first time you fly it. Go to the moon. <laughs> so um, uh, I do want to recognize a few groups here before I start, near and dear to my heart. First, the, uh, uh, the XPRIZE team uh, over here to my left and, and throughout. Thank you guys for uh, your tremendous hard work. Those who are SEDS members in the audience, so please stand. My my first my first organization comes stand up to a SEDS member. And of course uh, the, uh, the, the the space mafia, the ISU clan. If you would, if you would please stand up. Bob, Bob Richard, my co-founder, and, and Michael Simpson, our, our our beloved president and leader. Um, it, I, I don't know if you guys feel as much as I do, but I really believe we are in an incredible time, an incredible time for the commercial space industry that we have not seen before. I know that those of you who have been going through this venture with me for the last 20 years, we sort of felt this a little bit in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, just after shuttle started, in the early days of you know, the SSI conferences and so forth, but I think it's real now. I think we're talking about real businesses and real breakthroughs and real opportunities that we've never had before. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Before I go into predictions, I want to talk a little bit about a historical perspective and some of my observations here. Uh, one, I believe that, um, that deep inside each of us is an exploration gene. Literally, the genetic manifestation of a need to explore. It's not everywhere, but it is in some number of humans. This is sort of a phenotype that if, because the human race has literally been driving itself to explore beyond the next horizon from the, you know, the Saharas of, of, of Africa, uh, beyond across the oceans, it's allowed us to basically uh, survive uh, disasters because we've been able to spread our seed around the nation, around the world. And that same exploration gene is going to drive us off the planet. It's inherent in us. Some small population, you guys all know the people would rather stay at home and sit on the couch and watch TV, right? And then you know the rest of us who would rather just risk everything we have to go and get off planet as soon as we can. And we've got a double dose of this exploration gene, and it's in us and it's in us bad, and we're going to drive and drive and drive until we get off this planet. So, so civilizations grow and they mature, and they get bureaucratic. And it happened in the United Kingdom, and then America came along, and now it's happening in America, and a new civilization needs to come along very shortly. And we're driven to go off planet. And um, we go off in search of certain things. And historically, if you look at, if you want to know about the future, look historically. Because the same genetics, we genetically are identical, identical to humans 10,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago. We rest basically on our laurels and our technology, the knowledge that we've learned. So look back at what has driven humanity time and time again. You know, it's the, really the drive for continued freedom. It's the drive for resources. It's the drive for wealth and things like that. The same, if you look at the motivation to why to go into space, it's the same motivations. So read the history books and look at what's driven us before. We've had the visionaries of Tsiolkovsky and of Goddard and von Braun, you know, and, and what these folks have done. If you look back at what von Braun did in Nazi Germany, it was incredible what you can do with literally a dictatorship. What are the numbers? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, 6,000 V2s built, 6,000 missiles built in, in Nazi Germany. The recurring cost of $13,000 a launch for those vehicles. You can bring the cost down with mass production. We'll come back to what will drive. What's that? 
and slave labor. Thank you, yes, thank you. But you know, but, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you that, that uh, the rest of us would happily be slave labor for that mission. I should be careful about that. Can we erase that from the videotape? So, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that mass production of rockets is possible if you have a real marketplace. Um, and war is not a good one. <laughs> Moving forward, though, <laughs> the vision of Apollo. Again, uh, you know, you've heard me talk about this if you've heard my presentations. In 1961, uh, when Gagarin had flown and Kennedy got up on May 25th, just a few weeks from now, and said, we're going to the moon. He had absolutely no right to make that statement. Absolutely no right. We had never flown a human to orbit in, Amer in America. And the thought of going to the moon by the end of the decade was, was preposterous. And yet, what happened was that people who had that vision left their jobs. They left college. They went to obscure locations like Huntsville. <laughs> And, and Titusville, and Clear Lake, Texas. I mean, who had heard these places? But they went with passion because there was a mission, a clear, defined mission. And the average age of these people was what? 26 years old. And they made it up. They made up impossible things. The navigation, the guidance, the structures, the propulsion that had never existed before. And I love saying that they made it work because there was no one else there to tell them what couldn't work. There no graybeard saying, well, you can't do it that way, son. We didn't do it that way 30 years ago. <laughs> they made it up as they went along. And they took risks because they had a clear goal, a clear vision. And that drove them to take risks. You know, the Apollo 1 fire, I mean, imagine how rapidly we recovered from that. The LEM was literally designed in a year and then constructed in a year. Amazing capabilities with a slide rule! <laughs> with a slide rule! We had no computing capability. And now it takes us three times longer to get back to the moon? I mean, has, has, what's, have our brains gotten that much slower with computational capability a million times faster? Or a billion times faster? What has happened? Well, it was 1992. It was the International Space Year. I don't know if you may remember the International Space Year. It was uh, ISY, 1992, the 500th anniversary of, of uh, Gagarin. I still, I've lost my, there we go. The 500th anniversary of Gagarin. Columbus. Of Columbus. <laughs> Of, of Columbus, and we, uh, we committed ourselves in 1992 to actually complete the International Space Station and commit going back to the Moon and Mars. I don't know if you remember, we actually did it back in 92, they just kept it a secret. Um, <laughs> and at the end of 92, I, I said to myself, what has gone wrong here? Why didn't it work? What went wrong? And it really bothered me. It was actually the year, I remember it was, uh, it was January 1st, 2000, 1993, and I sat and I said, what went wrong? And I think I figured it out. And it's when I gave up on the government getting us any place. So what went wrong was a realization of the conditions in the 60s were so unique. What were they? Number one, we actually in space went after the low-hanging fruit. We actually did the easiest things. And we did them on literally a six-month and one-year schedule. So we would do something amazing on a literally once and twice a year that was record-breaking. And it was great for the newspapers and great for politics. The politicians loved it. Literally, every time you know, that, that the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo missions would reach a little bit further, it was great for politicians. Number two, we had a much, much more risk-tolerant attitude. We were willing to take risks because we were racing to the moon against the evil Soviet Union. Number three, it was a clear and very focused goal. Back then, no one knew what we couldn't do. 
Again, the attitude of those 26-year-olds. Um, there were no entrenched bureaucracies. There was no one there sort of protecting their turf and saying, well, can't go manned, or we can't go planet, or whatever it was. We had a clear goal. And then reality was we were living in a time with a much simpler political system. It was oligarchy. We had a number of people at the top who controlled how we spent our money. And when Kennedy died in an assassination, that instance of martyrdom drove us to the moon. That political time will not exist again. And our ability to literally mount programs that are decades long over multiple Congresses and multiple presidents is a really tough thing to do. And I'm just telling you this because I want to paint what I believe is the true picture. You know, there are three things that will drive us forward, and the same things that have driven us forward over the history. It's fear, it's curiosity, and it's resources. Now, fear drove us to the moon. I pray every night for an asteroid to come barreling down towards us with a 10-year head start. <laughs> Because I guarantee you, you know, our, our space programs would, you know, miraculously grow. <laughs> I'll stop it, Peter, don't worry. Okay, I know you will. <laughs> Rusty, we have faith that you will get us there. You know, uh, that's fear. There's curiosity, but I want to let you, curiosity is, if you want to actually measure curiosity, curiosity is NASA's science budget. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what drives NASA science budget. So you want to measure the drinking, the shrinking science budget against that's how much it drives us. Unfortunately, I think it should be the largest budget we have driving us forward. The third is the strongest, and that's resources going out. And I think as this last decade has been focused on opening up personal space flight, the next decade will be sowing the seeds for opening up the resources because ultimately, that's what will benefit humanity. We don't have enough iron and nickel and elements on this planet to allow the growth of India and China and the developing worlds that we have here in the US. We don't have it. As long as we look at the Earth as a closed ecosphere, wait till you see Al Gore's movie coming out in about a month. We are in serious trouble here, folks. It's not global warming. You know, that's a fuzzy little term. It is a climate crisis we're in. And we better pay attention really fast, really quick. Or space will go off the radar before you even know it. And we're going to be worrying about how to you know, deal with floods and deal with, with, uh, with issues that we don't want to even think about. You know, going forward, when you look at resources, you know, Jerry O'Neill's dream, and, and he was a mentor and a friend for me, and I know for many of us here, he made one mistake. He depended on the space shuttle as the mode of transportation. He believed, as many believed, the 50 flights a year, the you know, $10 million a flight, and all of that stuff. Well, that's unfortunate. So to open up space in the near term, we have to focus on the one critical thing, and that is the cost of gain of orbit. You know that old adage, the cost of gain of orbit, stupid. That is it. Nothing else matters. Once we get that down, once we build the railroads, the analogy I use is Alaska. We bought Alaska from the Russians in the 1850s. It was called Seward's Folly because the Secretary of State bought it for four million dollars and it was considered a waste of money. A waste of money. I want you to remember how they described it in the pamphlets back then. This desolate, far away place. Impossible to get to. You go there without the proper suiting on and you'll die. Sounds like space. <laughs> it sounds like space. And then we built the roads to get there. And now we take our honeymoons there. Besides the multi, you know, the trillion dollar economy of gold and timber and fishing and oil, those same things will occur once we build the railroads, the airlines, the shipping lanes, the roads to get to space. That's got to be the function. Now, in terms of getting to, to suborbital flight, that's on a roll. The, 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 the fuse is lit, we're going, we're going, we're gone. It's going to happen. It'll be the first other profitable business, the first one with humans, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have played a small role in that one. Looking forward to orbit, the price today is $20 million if you want to go up with the, uh, with the Russians. I think the price will come down with current systems down to about $5 million. 
I think we can get it down to $5 million. But obviously that's not enough. On the other end of the spectrum, my friends with space elevators and, and so forth will tell you, that you can calculate you know, the MGH and 1 half mv squared to get you to orbit. The total number of, the total amount of power, uh, it's uh, 5.7 5 gigajoules. Spend that over an hour at 1.6 megawatts for you and your spacesuit. Buy it off the grid here for seven cents a kilowatt hour. And the price for you and your spacesuit is? 100 bucks, 100 bucks. So our price improvement curve is $20 million <laughs> down to $100. Now, maybe some new physics in the road, but I am extremely, <laughs> I passed over that one really fast. <laughs> but I am extremely hopeful about actually some real breakthroughs. And let me, let me share a couple of ideas with you. In the near term, um, there is actually a new field being researched uh, by DARPA called uh, high energy density materials. Uh, these are designer molecules of boron, nitrogen, hydrogen that have very high strain bond angles. Uh, these materials have, first of all, high ISPs on the order of five, 550 to 600 seconds. But more importantly, they have very high densities, much higher than LOX and hydrogen. Now take that kind of energetic fuel and mix it in with composites made from carbon nanotubes. And we do have single stage orbit capability. And so for the first time ever, I can see a road for some near term breakthroughs that are not new physics, they're material science. And that's an area that you know, I've been thinking about, maybe there's a good XPRIZE to have in, in that arena. So get ready for that, and maybe an orbital ticket will come down to a few hundred thousand dollars. Let's talk about the moon. Once we have that capability of getting to orbit, even at the $5 million mark, there are going to be some groups of, I'll say us, because I'll be one of them if, if, if you're not out there competing with me, to stockpile fuel on orbit, and they make the first beeline to the moon. We're going to have some very interesting political games when people actually plant private flags on the moon. Or start sending private rovers to land there. Because we can put a rover on the moon privately for 20 to $50 million. And I do believe that will happen in the next five years. I think we'll have a number of private companies landing private rovers on the moon and starting to talk about, well, this is an exclusionary zone, guys. I own this piece of land. And then it's going to get a lot of fun. <laughs> Asteroids, the same thing. You know the delta V to get into an asteroid is a lot simpler than getting and landing on the moon. And, uh, you know, these, these $20 trillion checks floating around out there, though it's not coming too close, will be driven by entrepreneurs. So uh, there's a lot of great resources to be had. And I'm looking at many of my friends out there who have been talking about this with us for for a long time. But I asked myself a while ago, how would I get to Mars if I wanted to go to Mars? Because I don't believe that the ability for the US government to actually spend the money to get humans there. I'd love to believe it's true, but I don't think politically it will ever survive. Maybe getting back to the moon, but to get humans to Mars, I think there's a mechanism to get people there privately a lot faster than getting folks there on the government doll. So here it is. This is Peter's me mechanism to get to the moon privately. You ready? Woo! Okay. I'm serious about this. It's called the Mars Citizenship Program. All right? I believe it's possible, and I do, first of all, want to say that the only way to go to Mars is one way. One way. One way. You're going there, you're committed, and you're not coming back. Let me take a poll here. How many folks if you had a 50-50 shot uh, colonization mission to the Mars, would go. Raise your hand, please. Okay, keep, uh, okay. a one in three chance. One in three chance. I didn't see any hands changing here. <laughs> a lot of friends of mine back there, where is their hand? I do believe that that is the way to go. And there's no government on the world will send a person on a one-way mission 
They will never take the risk. This is a private mission only. One way. Price tag for that, about $5 billion for a reasonable system. So let's talk about how you might get there. First of all, imagine if you would a private a Mars citizenship program. It looks something like this. It starts with a very wealthy individual willing to put his or her name on the line, or a hyper-credible movie star, or someone of global notoriety. This program has to be born above the line of super credibility. There's a line of credibility I call where if you if you if you announce something below this line of credibility, it's dead. No one will ever believe it. Above the line of credibility, it has a chance of succeeding or failure. There's a line of super credibility. If you announce it the right way above the line of super credibility, it will succeed. When we announced the X Prize, I had the NASA administrator there, head of the FAA, 20 astronauts, Bert Rutan, Eric Lindbergh. People never ask me, do you have the money? Are there any teams out there? <laughs> they believe that mission, and we made it real. So this has to be born above that line of super credibility with the right person. The Mars Institute program is 100,100 people. 100,000 people, I'm sorry, 90,000 people spending $10,000. Okay, that's $900 million. They're putting forward, they're buying that program. 10,000 people spending $100,000. That's a billion. And then 100 people spending a million dollars. That's another 100 million. It adds up to $2 billion. They're buying a ticket for this citizenship. Total revenue, $2 billion. If you go out and you look at Harvard and Dartmouth and the Ivy League schools that have large multi-billion dollar endowments, they have averaged over the last 15 to 20 years a rate of return of about 15 to 17 percent. Pretty steadily. $2 billion at about 15 percent will get you in the decade $8 billion of capital. So hold that number in your mind. Imagine now a series of advanced missions being built by this team. Very efficiently, they don't have to bid anything out. It's, prime. it's, a, it's a commercial focused organization, just like the early Apollo days. They start sending to Mars a nuclear reactor to land. Habitats, remote control rovers, food supplies. Those 100,000 people now are whittled down by a one in a thousand lottery to 101 finalists that are going on that one-way mission. By the way, your citizenship that you bought is transferable to your children. It's also saleable. There's only 100,000 that are given out. Those 100 people undergo medical briefings and selections, going down to two crews of six, primary crew and a backup crew. And that primary crew now gets launched to orbit on whatever technology you have onto a space station. That space station, let's use a Vasmir engine or something to accelerate out to Mars. That space station, which is their home for three months or six months or nine months, goes whizzing by Mars. You don't care where it goes. It goes, you don't want to stop that mass. You hop out in your capsules and you just descend the people down to the surface. And there they land to their habitats, their power, their, rendez their, their autonomous uh, craft down there ready to rendezvous with them. Back on Earth is 100,000 people rooting for them and politically supporting them and ready to make sure that there's recurring supplies and support going to them. It's a one-way colonization mission. The next six will go, the next six will go, and the next six will go. It's privately fundable if it's credible. So I want to leave you with those thoughts. The next decade is about resources. Getting to Mars is a private mission, not a government mission. Just my thoughts to share with you tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if, if you have time. I uh, any any questions? Yes. Um, I think that uh, uh, a asteroid return mission um, or getting private vehicles on the moon 
uh, would make an excellent X Prize. So that's definitely something that uh, we're excited about. I can also tell you it's on the Centennial Challenges critical path. Uh, we have a great group of people there that are thinking out of the box. There's got to be other questions. Yes. Peter, I'm in. All right. Let's go. Peter, what should we look forward to uh, this year in Las Cruces? Ah, well, thank you for the. Uh, we are going to have an <laughs> we're going to have an incredible October, October 18th through 21st at the X Prize Cup. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, I mean, we're going to have about over three and a half million dollars in cash prizes up for grabs. We're going to have the Lunar Lander Challenge. Uh, we're very proud that we're going to be working with the, uh, uh, with the Space Work Foundation on elevator games. We'll be announcing that officially in a couple weeks. Um, we have uh, another challenge, reusable rocket challenge, coming down the line. We're going to see something like 25 to 30 rocket flights, or maybe more, in the course of two days. Uh, and it's, again, you know, I'm, not, it, I'm tired of going to a, to a government-run shuttle launch and having something I never get a chance to look and, and touch up close, launch five miles away. Um, and it's, you know, space has to become personal again. It has to become something that we can own and relate to and be part of and can inspire us and, and make it personal. And that's the goal we're trying to do in Las Cruces, to make space personal, make it exciting and fun, something that is, uh, you know, something that we can each feel we can do. But not something that someone else does for us. Peter, I think you succeeded it. I was there last year. It was fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Please. When you were talking about the Mars mission before, it sounded like you had some kind of very specific ideas in mind about super credibility and a high net worth individual or somebody with global notoriety. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, well, me. Not. Um, it sounds like you have some maybe people in mind or anything. Do you have feelers out to different people and stuff to talk about? Well, this is the first time I'm speaking about this idea publicly, and I do think it's an idea that needs to. Um, uh, if it were to materialize, has to be done very, very carefully and done in that fashion. Um, I, one of the things that makes me absolutely uh, convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this time we are literally at the, at the critical escape velocity for commercial space is that the wealth required to make any of these things happen is within the hands of individual decision makers. It doesn't take a board of directors. It doesn't take a government agency. It takes a person saying, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And that's that one inspired person, I mean, what do you do with billions and billions of dollars if you have a chance of literally changing the world? Now, Elon Musk has a great uh, phrase. He calls backing up the biosphere. At the end of the day, we are obligated. It is a moral obligation of our human race at this time to back up the biosphere. Right. It takes just you know one other 9/11 experience of having some unbeknownst, unimaginable, unforeseen disaster occur, um, and you know we're plummeting back a hundred years, if not more. So um, backing up the biosphere is, is a critical part. Thank you guys very much. It is my pleasure to be back here again, and thank you, George. Kind of hard to really say much after a speaker like Peter, and it is always, I, I guess, I well, this is my 17th straight ISDC, and so I've had the opportunity and privilege of listening to Peter speak on many occasions. And last year, he wrapped up uh, our last ISDC uh, with some very inspirational words, and again, now he's setting us some new goals for the future, which is definitely in keeping with the mood and spirit of this conference. Uh, and of course the organizations that are behind it, but I guess as we are now looking to some of the things that we can do to change the future, uh, part of what this conference does, and in particular what this, uh, rather what this banquet is about tonight, are uh, handing out awards to those who have 
done things for us in the past and those who are still doing things right here and now. And so I'd like to now take us on to the awards part of our uh, evening. And one of the uh, major awards that we give is the Heinlein Award. Uh, most people who are science fiction readers would know that name extremely well. Uh, every two years the members of the National Space Society uh, vote to nominate a recipient of the Robert A. Heinlein Award, Robert A. Heinlein Memorial Award. Uh, the award honours individuals who've made significant contributions to the creation of a free spacefaring civilization. These contributions can be in any form, but those whose actions have involved personal, financial uh, risk, social risk, uh, they are considered particularly meritorious. Before we announce the winner of the award, um, I'd like to share some of the background for the award. Robert A. Heinlein was recognised as the Dean of Science Fiction Writers and was also a member of the original L5 Society's board uh, from about 1976 to 1984. He contributed enormously to the space program by educating millions of readers, myself included, about space while entertaining them. And I think that's, again, something we're, we're seeing a little bit of throughout this conference we had science fiction authors uh, speaking today. Our award is given in his memory every two years and consists of a miniature brass naval cannon. This is the award here. I, I'm sorry for those folks who can't see from that side. <clears throat> it's mounted on a solid mahogany base and consists of a miniature uh, with a brass plaque and an inlay of Indian black granite. The barrel is inscribed with one of Robert Heinlein's favourite acronyms, Tanstaffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> Canon is a symbol found in one of Heinlein's masterpieces, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, and represents both the Lunar Republic and also defiance of conventional wisdom when necessary. This year, members of the society, and bear in mind this is voted for by the members, have voted for an individual who is well known worldwide. Brigadier General Charles E. Chuck Yeager has accomplished many firsts in his long career and is an inspiration to many young people who enter the field of aviation. We have a short five minute video of General Yeager's career and a brief video acceptance speech from General Yeager. So we'll just play that now. Charles E. Chuck Yeager has been called a lot of things in his 80 years, but none more fitting than a true American hero. 18 year old Chuck Yeager enlisted in the Army Air Corps in September 1941. As Jaeger's squadron mate and lifelong friend, Colonel C.E. Bud Anderson recalled, Chuck became the yardstick by which we could measure the rest. Chuck could fly right from the start. He was pretty impressive. Jaeger got his first taste of combat in February 1944. Blessed with exceptional 2010 vision, Jaeger had eyes that could see forever. He combined this advantage with cunning, concentration, relentless ferocity, and superb piloting skills to rack up over a dozen aerial victories. In June 1947, Jaeger was selected to make the attempt to become the first person to exceed the speed of sound in the rocket-powered Bell X-1. Jaeger and the rest of the small Air Force test team met in Edwards in late July, amidst many experts who believed the so-called sound barrier was impenetrable. On October 14, 1947, after several close attempts, Jaeger and the X-1 dropped from the B-29 launch aircraft and bolted into the wild blue yonder. The X-1 rapidly accelerated to Mach 0.98. And then, at 43,000 feet, the needle on his Mach meter jumped off the scale. Chuck Jaeger had just broken the invisible threshold to fly faster than the speed of sound. He attained a top speed of Mach 1.06. When Jaeger's achievement was finally declassified in June of 1948, he was quickly accorded celebrity status, the fastest man alive. While his flights in the X-1 guaranteed celebrity, it was Jaeger's performance over the next seven years as an experimental test pilot that earned him legendary status. Jaeger has called these years his golden age of flying and fun. It was an age when the limits of time, space, and the imagination were being dramatically expanded. 
After launch on December 12, 1953, Jaeger lit his rocket engine and the Bell X-1A and pulled into a climb. At 62,000 feet, he started his pushover and finally leveled out at 76,000 feet at Mach 1.9. Using full thrust, he accelerated to Mach 2.44, that's 1,650 miles per hour. After he cut his engine, the X-1A started a slow roll. As he corrected for this, it rolled sharply to the right. Another correction and it snapped to the left and tumbled violently out of control. The X-1A was snapping and rolling and spinning about all three axes, and he took a beating in the cockpit as he plummeted more than 50,000 feet before somehow managing to recover to level flight at 25,000 feet. Jaeger returned to Edwards as Deputy Director of Flight Test in 1961. The following year, he assumed command of the new United States Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School, where he presided over the development of a first-of-a-kind institution designed to prepare U.S. military test pilots for space flight. In February of 1975, Jaeger returned to Edwards Air Force Base for his last official active duty flight in an F-4C Phantom II. When he climbed out of the cockpit that day, he had accumulated a total of 10,132 hours of flight time across more than 180 of the military's most sophisticated aircraft. While he has long been an Air Force icon, the 1979 publication of Tom Wolfe's bestseller, The Right Stuff, vaulted Jaeger into international celebrity. And the 1983 motion picture based on the book further solidified his hold on the public imagination. On October 14, 1997, General Yeager returned to Edwards to commemorate the 50th anniversary of his milestone flight in the Bell X-1. His flight that morning was telecast live to a worldwide audience. Among the many offering congratulations was former President George Bush, who captured the essence of the man and his achievements when he wrote, if I was asked to choose one word that would define Chuck Yeager, it would be service. Fighter pilot, test pilot, combat commander, you have always valued service to our country above all else. Chuck, the courage, resourcefulness, and integrity which you have displayed so magnificently throughout over five decades of service to the United States are the very qualities that built this country into the greatest nation on earth. This is, this is cheesy, isn't it? <laughs> Hold it right next to the speaker. You know, I really feel proud that you were singling me out to award the Heinemann Award to me. That means a lot, of, a lot to us military guys who, you know, sacrifice a lot and don't receive a lot in return. But basically, I'm sorry I won't be with you tonight. But I appreciate you doing Thanks, one thing, and that's letting Colonel Russ Slate accept the award for me. And Russ, I appreciate you taking time out of your hard life but to come down and accept the award for me. I've known Russ, uh, he was a colonel in the Air Force, uh, he, he was General Mays aide, he was a, but most famously a test pilot at Wright Field in 1945 when I came there. And I've flown with him. Well, he's an outstanding pilot. We hunted and fished together. He can't hunt worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all in all, uh, Russ, thanks a lot for accepting this award for me. And uh, I appreciate receiving the Highland Award. It, it's something that military guys appreciate more than you know. And thank you very much. As you've already heard, uh, accepting the Heinlein Award on General Yeager's behalf is Colonel Russell Schley. Uh, just in case you didn't all hear that, clearly I'll give you a bit of a brief introduction. Um, 
Colonel Schlage had 20 years with the Air Force. He flew and tested virtually every bomber from the B-17 Flying Fortress to the B-52. Began his flying career in 1940 in the civilian pilot training program, program and flew in World War II with General Curtis LeMay and became a part of LeMay's efforts through wartime experience to develop the concept of precision bombing tactics which became the standard of the 8th Air Force in World War II. On that note, I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity for Colonel Schley to say a couple of words. I'll bring the, uh, the microphone down to you. to present a token of their own gratitude on their behalf. Uh, Mr. Bob Tan, the Executive Vice President of the General Chuck Yeager Foundation, would just like to make a brief presentation. And I'll keep it brief for you, Russ. I have a special gift for Russ Schley from the Yeagers uh, to thank him for being here today to accept this most prestigious award on behalf of General Yeager, who couldn't attend. Uh, Russ, the Yeagers want you to have this special pendant, a commemorative pendant of the Aviation Hall of Fame induction of General Yeager. Uh, it's one of a kind, and they'd like you to have this. And again, uh, Those of you who uh, have the chance to view this, this is the Broadway Highland Memorial Award down here. It's a little large to lift up, otherwise I would do that. But perhaps later in the evening, at the end of proceedings, you might like to come up and have a closer viewing of it yourself. But we do have a number of uh, other awards to give this evening. The, the Highland Award is, of course, the most prestigious. However, uh, the Society also awards a number of awards called the Space Pioneer Award. <laughs> The Space Pioneer Awards recognise those individuals and teams whose accomplishments have helped to open the space frontier. The awards are divided into a number of categories, such as media, space business, legislator, science, educator, engineer, and space activist of the year. The intent is to recognise those who have made significant contributions in different fields of endeavour to the cause of developing a spacefaring civilization which will establish communities beyond the Earth which is, of course, the National Space Society's vision. The award itself, and again, I can't really pick these up without the risk of dropping them on my toes. Uh, we have two of these here. The award itself is a rendering of the moon in pewter, created by the noted artist Don Davis and produced by the Baker Art Foundry in Placerville, California. Now, the moon may not at first seem to be an appropriate choice to represent the spirit of a space pioneer, However, the choice of the moon becomes clearer when it's considered that in almost any scenario involving expansion of humanity into space, that development of the moon's resources is a critical component. The award is given to recognise the pioneering spirit of those who strive to make space a place where people have the opportunity to go and make a life for themselves. <coughs> Earlier in the conference, we presented Space Pioneer Awards to Elon Musk of SpaceX, and to Dr. Michael Griffin. Uh, that award was accepted on his behalf by Shannon Dale, the Deputy NASA Administrator. And that was, uh, I think, in yesterday's sessions, if I recall correctly. Uh, another Space Pioneer Award uh, has been given this year, and the winner of that, Dr. Harrison Jack Smith, unfortunately is unable, is unable to attend the conference, and we'll present that award to him 
at a later date. However, tonight, we honour the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's Hayabusa, or Yusa C mission team, with a Space Pioneer Award for their accomplishments in science and engineering. This mission is to bring back samples from an asteroid and to investigate the mysteries of the birth of the solar system. It's the first one to use an ion drive as the primary means of propulsion for the mission, and it was launched almost exactly three years ago to the day, on the 9th of May in 2003. It arrived at the asteroid Itakawa, named after the late Dr. Hideo Itakawa, the father of Japan's space development program. Now, earlier in the conference, we had uh, a wonderful presentation by Professor Junichiro Kawaguchi, the project manager of the Hayabusa. And we are honoured to have him accept the award on the mission team's behalf. We're also honoured to have Professor Kuninori Tonobusuki, a senior executive of the Hayabusa project, and also here re representing JAXA. However, just before we ask them to come up and accept the award, I'd like to invite uh, Bruce Betts from the Planetary Society, who would also like to add a quick word on the society's behalf. Thank you. I just am uh, here representing the Planetary Society and all our members to add our congratulations to the Hayabusa team. This has been an incredible mission and one that our members have been incredibly enthusiastic about, fascinated by. I also am here representing uh, Bruce Murray, one of our co-founders, who was unable to be here this evening, but I know has worked, uh, visited, and worked with various of you individually, and he wanted to pass along his congratulations. So, congratulations on such an incredible mission. Thank you. Uh, if I could, I'd like to invite Dana Johnson, who is the chairman of our awards committee, to come up and help me with these presentations, these awards. And if I could now invite uh, Professor Kawaguchi and Professor Usagi to come up and receive the award. same business that the deep space and exploration uh, in the United States and also the, the, in the world. And uh, when think of you know, the uh, you know, we should keep going you know, to you know to, to the this, this business, the, the uh, deep space exploration. And we think of the uh, the United States has a very good culture you know, the, of uh, acknowledging and admiring the achievements in order to extract and uh, encourage them the new advances. No, we are deeply impressed in those way. And uh, thank you very much. No, once again, thank you very much. Uh, now, Mark is the 
is probably well known to anyone who comes to these conferences uh, and is a long-standing member of the society and its uh, predecessors. He actually initiated the merger negotiations and conducted most of the L sites, L5 society side of the transactions in the merger between the National Space Institute and the L5 society, which of course created the National Space Society that we're all familiar with today. That merger was back in 1987. He has received degrees in economics from Caltech and Harvard, and he's written in numerous space economics articles, which again, many of you who have been around these conferences for a number of years will be familiar with. He's currently serving as our NSS Senior Vice President and uh, as the Senior Operating Officer for the Society, a relatively newly created role about a year or so ago. So uh, I would like to invite Mark up here with the knowledge that he has been actively involved with NSS for 24, well, involved with NSS for 30 years, but actively involved in the senior position for 24 of those 30 years. So Mark, would you like to come up and present the rest of the awards, please? Thank you, Kirby. I'm greatly honored to present the National Excellence Awards for Outstanding Service to NSS. Actors are the foundation of NSS and our lifeblood. Without the actors, NSS wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be able to contribute to our long range goal of space settlements. Last year, we took as a task to greatly increase our, in, the strength of our active structure. And we began that at the 2005 ISTC. And that worked remarkably well. So we decided to push it to a new level, starting with this ISTC. So if there's anybody out there, and I suspect there are, who would like to get involved with the National Space Society's volunteer, there are in the registration package a form that you can fill out and send in, and I assure you that we will use it. The type of actors that are particularly demand right now are authors for our online publication. We are also looking for help with content of our website. And most important of all, we're looking for people with expertise in leading other volunteers. The uh, awards committee selected the recipients and the basic idea behind the awards committee is that they are ineligible to receive any of these awards. And this year's awards committee consisted of myself, Larry Ahern, Greg Allison, Dana Johnson, Margaret Jordan, and John Strickland. There are two basic criteria for receiving these awards. One is service to NSS, particularly in the last year, and secondly, there is resistance to giving an award more than you know, every, every year. So if you get one last year, it's a lot harder to get one this year. <laughs> Not impossible, but a lot harder. The first award will go to a lawyer, to his own firm, a longtime friend of myself, although in the past we haven't always agreed. <laughs> he is a former senior vice president founder of two chapters, originator of the Chapters Assembly. He has served NSS in various capacities for two decades, currently a member of our board of directors. And the main reason we're giving him this award because on a pro bono basis, he did a lot of legal work for us in the last year. And particularly, and most importantly, he's become a really great expert at negotiating hotel contracts. <laughs> And it's a significant reason why we're going to walk away from this conference with quite a bit of money. Jeffrey Liss. Again. 
He is uh, chair of the Internet Services Committee. I guess he figured out who he was. Uh, and is intimately involved at the moment in another major upgrade in our website. We had a tremendous improvement on our website in the last 18 months, but we're going to take it to a new level again. He's a Boeing Space Systems Engineer, a graduate of MIT, the only non-officer on our operations committee, and he's getting this because he's an extremely hard worker and very confident. And give me an example, a couple months ago, took a whole week off without pay, went to uh, NSS office in DC to uh, work on a number of important problems. This is the sort of thing he does all the time. And of course, I'm talking about running the job. And let me tell you, with the exception of Jeffrey, who somehow found out, none of these people know they're getting these rewards until I make it sort of obvious. <laughs> Which is why we're not going to ask any of them to make any remarks until it gets the biggest reward at the end, and then we're going to embarrass them. The next speaker, uh, the next person gets the award. <laughs> but not the next speaker, is an aerospace engineering designer at Space Systems Laurel. She has been commended for outstanding problem-solving ability. She's a former Space Pack Administrator, a member of the organization for 25 years, also a longtime member of various chapters, such as on the board of directors of various chapters, such as Los Angeles, the San Francisco chapter, also a longtime member of our California regional organization. She is the NSS co-chair of this conference. The other co-chair was Bruce Betts, the Planetary Society, and so here a few minutes ago. But probably the most interesting aspect of this particular person is that not only is she co-chair of this conference, she has been chair of two previous ISDCs. <laughs> no other individual in the history of NSS has been foolish enough <laughs> be chair of more than one conference. So, for being extremely foolish, we present you with this award. Secretary of the Society, which, which really is a big deal. I was once Secretary of the Society, believe me, is a very big deal. He is also the editor of Downlink. Now, let's set that up. First, full time job, master's degree, secretary, editor of Downlink. And on top of that, he just foolishly agreed a few, about a month ago <laughs> to be chair of the 208 Congress. And it is, oh, wait, one other thing. He's running for election for re-election in the NSS Board of Directors election at this minute. Uh, that's a hint. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about Josh Powers.
We have one more National Excellence Award, and then we will have the premier space actress here. <laughs> this next recipient is chair of the NSS Education Committee. She is a high school physics teacher who has come all the way from Australia to this conference. She has an NSS chapter at her school, and she just won the Churchill Fellowship, which is a big deal in Australia. It's one of those things where if you can come up with an idea which they think is a sufficient service to Australia, they will give you a substantial grant. In this case, she's using that money to take a six-week trip around the world where she's going to various schools in America, Germany, Norway, and checking out how they do aerospace education at the high school level. There's actually schools in the United States, I didn't realize this, magnet schools, which do aerospace education at the high school level. And then she's going to go back to Australia and uh, communicate the lessons she's learned. This is not the only award that she's won. In 2004, she won the Caltex and Rotary Award for Innovation in Teaching. And, well, again, with a substantial grant. Well, I talked to her husband to see if there's some sort of interesting stories about her. <laughs> and, and this is what he said, and, uh, and I'm not uh, saying this is correct, but this is what he said. She's known for the, what he called the Great Fire of 98. <laughs> It turns out this individual likes to launch rockets. And one of these rockets crashed in a field, and there was a very substantial brush fire, which the fire engines had to come and all that stuff. That's not all. One of her friends made a smoke bomb. Okay, this individual said, oh, that's cool. Why don't you make a really big smoke bomb? So her friend went out and made a smoke bomb, which is roughly 10 times bigger than the first one. And then, for reasons which are a bit obscure, somehow the smoke bomb went off in the classroom and created a great deal of smoke in her school. Not just in that classroom, but a whole bunch of classrooms. <laughs> her husband says her name is now strongly associated with explosions. <laughs> However, I think one of the most interesting things about her is whenever she wins an award, she uses part of the money to come to the United States and go to an ISDC. <laughs> Jenny Young, please come forward. premier activist award that the National Space Society puts out. This is the Chris Pancras Space Activist of the Year Award for 2006. It's named after Chris because he was CEO of the NSS during a rough period when we didn't have an executive director. And he worked full-time and then some in order to cover the duties of both the CEO and the executive director. And he did all this on a pro bono basis. We found out, we did this for about a year, we found out towards the end of the year, not because he told us, but because it became obvious, that he was dying of cancer. He truly believed in our cause, in our cause of space settlements, to the point that he spent most of his last year on Earth helping society. If Chris could be here today and see this crowd and see this conference, and the spectacular job the organizers of this conference have done, I'm sure they'd be a happy man. It's a great honor for me to present the Chris Pancrantz Space Actress of the Year Award 
to an individual primarily because of his amazing dedication. He is Vice President of Public Affairs. 18 months ago, he was an account executive at Hill & Knowlton, which is one of the major PR companies in the world. Now he is a public relations manager at the Rubin Fleet Science Center in San Diego. In between, he worked on a volunteer basis, at least 80 hours a week, for a whole year for NSS. And his major reason why NSS's media presence has exploded in the last year. Some of the articles that he placed were in places such as Space News, The Economist, Wire Magazine, and NBC Nightly News. He's also running for election. <laughs> Let me read you something from his campaign statement. I've dedicated my life to generating widespread support for Space Summit. I can think of no better individual to receive this award, no better individual to test what he's done in the spirit of Chris Pancras than Jeremy Pine. I have no idea what to say. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. I honestly don't know what to say right now. Um, but like Mark said, um, uh, life is much happier when you're dedicating your life to something that is in line with your passion and when you feel like you're making a, a little bit of a difference toward something that will well, leave the world a better place than when you found it. So. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, our evening is beginning to wind down. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to invite Greg Allison uh, to come up and say a few words. Greg is a member of our Board of Directors, a former Chairman of the Executive Committee, and he is the Chairman of the Policy Committee. So Greg just has a couple of quick words for us. Thank you very much. I tend to overpower these speakers if I'm not careful for my microphones. Uh, the Policy Committee, is all about helping us realize our dreams of selling space. And I know every one of you are for that. Uh, there's a little piece of paper in everyone's registration package, and it's about registration for an upcoming event. June the 4th through the 7th, we're going to Washington, D.C., we're going to put feet on the hill, we're going to run down the halls, lobby Congress, and, and push for, for the future of settlements in space. I implore every one of you and ask you to Sign up and come to Washington, D.C. next month. Do it. See y'all there. As we begin to, uh, to wrap up this evening, uh, as one who's run the Australian Space Development Conference, which is a much smaller version of this conference, and I've done it a number of times, I have to really appreciate all the hard work that the volunteers and all the members of the various organisations have put into uh, bringing this event together. So I think it's appropriate that we thank the organisers and volunteers of this year's conference and uh, perhaps, perhaps I could ask them to stand up. And Pat, would you stand up? I know you've been up here before so we know you, but any of the other volunteers <laughs> organising the conference, would you like to stand up and be recognised?
guess that says it all for my my STC organisers. Uh, I'd certainly like to thank all the members of the awards committee. They've been mentioned before, but uh, again, Dana Johnson, Margaret Jordan, Mark Hopkins, Larry A. Hearn, Greg Allison, Fred Ordway, George Whitesides, and especially John Strickland uh, here at the front table for helping with the presentation of the Robert A. Heinlein Award. Uh, and the, fake, uh, the uh, folks at the Baker Art Foundry in Placerville, California, who made the Space Pioneer Awards. It's been a tremendous conference. It's still a tremendous conference because we've still got another two-thirds of a day or so of uh, presentations going on again tomorrow. A couple of quick closing uh, items here. Uh, the ISDC has sponsored, as part of its space art focus, a very special outside installation tonight. It's a 32 foot high inflated sphere, lit from the inside and evoking the planets. It was installed by the noted Australian artist Matthew Jocelyn. To get to the sphere, you must exit the hotel and walk half a block east or away from the airport. Uh, the sphere will be on your left, and I find this last note interesting. You might visit this before the hospitality suites. So, <laughs> And on that note, a reminder that uh, the Space Frontier Foundation, co-sponsored with the XCOR Aerospace, will be hosting a uh, hospitality suite in, suite in rooms G5 and G7. I think that's also known as Salons 214 and 217. Uh, they are up on the second floor. The note says until 9pm well, until nobody is standing. <laughs> uh, take that to me, it's going to be a long night for some of you. So. Please make sure that you are back for the rest of the exciting presentations again tomorrow. Thank you all very much. I, I, like many of you fanning yourself in the audience, it's extremely warm up here. So uh, uh, thank you all for your attention. It's been a fantastic evening. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and I hope we will see you at next year's ISDC as well. Thank you very much.